837 via telephone, the uh, Attorney General of the state of West Virginia, Patrick Morrissey. Patrick, good morning. How are you? I am doing well. It's uh, good that you have uh, Harvey and team in there. I'm, I'm glad to be with you today. How much uh, do, your, the, do your paths cross there, you and Harvey here? You know, uh, quite a bit. We, uh, when I came in, we had a couple counties that uh, we did not handle the criminal appellate work for. And Jefferson and Berkeley, those were two of those counties. And when Matt came into office, uh, we worked closely together. And our office does a really good job on criminal appellate work. And we handle the appellate work for uh, Jefferson and Berkeley and all of the counties. Uh, there was just an anomaly before I arrived uh, that those counties didn't have uh, kind of the state representation. But, you know, Matt and I developed a really good working relationship, and uh, we work closely on criminal appellate issues. Do you do you have a guy like Matt Harvey in his office, Katie wilkes delegate here in Berkeley County, but do you wish that the state attorney general's office had criminal jurisdiction on occasion? You know, I would say that as a general matter— the prosecutors do a really good job, and that's the appropriate place uh, for criminal matters uh, to reside. Now, we do have some limited criminal jurisdiction for Medicaid fraud, where we actually work with the local prosecutors and we can assist and help uh, prosecute trials in that one narrow area. I've always thought that there could be a narrow exception that if you did it the right way, then there would be some narrow exceptions, perhaps it's election fraud or on ethics issues, things that uh, really could use an additional bit of uh, help and assistance. But look, uh, the legislature has always uh, chosen to go in a different direction. I think that uh, the prosecutors have done a great job across uh, West Virginia. Uh, I, I do believe that we would have been in a better position to help had that Supreme Court case we were involved in back from about 2014 or so gone a different direction. Because you may remember, Rob, we were asking uh, the court whether we could assist in some select uh, drug criminal matters. And the opioid epidemic and drug issues have been so prevalent across West Virginia. I thought that if we could help them, and in that case, it would have been of course, at the supervision of the county prosecutor, that would have been uh, better. But look, uh, I think right now uh, we're focusing on uh, locking down the structure for the uh, dealing with the opioid epidemic, the new foundation. And that's uh, what's on our legislative agenda. And uh, I think so many of the other changes are probably going to have to come and fall uh, to a future legislature or potentially a future attorney general. Uh, before I go to Matt Harvey, I want to ask you a question in regards, and again, I know you don't have criminal jurisdiction, but we talked to J.B. McCuskey about this, uh, the finance chairman of the Senate, Eric Tarr, and we've talked to various members of the House of Delegates as well, and that has to do with this money that's gone from the uh, federal government funds we received during COVID and ultimately into a, a, the governor's uh, own jurisdictional fund where he can direct it in any manner he seems to want to, to uh, direct it. And some of that money wound up going to Marshall University to finish their baseball stadium. And I think the dollar amount was around $10 million or so. Uh, as an attorney general, do you have any reason at all or jurisdiction at all to look into something like that as to its appropriateness? Well, uh, let me step back for a minute. So the attorney general can provide legal opinions to all the constitutional officers, to the prosecutors, to state agencies. And uh, I can tell you that uh, I don't believe our office was involved in that issue. Uh, but to the extent that there will be any efforts, for instance, uh, to the, for the feds to try to get any resources back, the AG would be charged with defending the state position. So I'm probably going to want to avoid talking uh, or committing to any specific position uh, simply because, you know, obviously we all oppose waste and fraud, and uh, but, you know, it's up to the attorney general to try to represent the state's position and make the argument about how the money was spent or that it was consistent with the law. So there are certainly opportunities, <coughs> excuse me, for us to get involved. 
I prefer generally when we're involved in the front end because you can avoid a lot of problems. Uh, but that doesn't always happen on a variety of issues where people just kind of uh, rush to the make the decision. I'm not saying here, just as a general matter, uh, it's always better to give that counsel up front. But uh, I'm going to uh, pause on that front because, as I said, if there's a matter that may go to court, I'm not going to put the state in a potentially compromising position without having all the details uh, at my fingertips. Can I read into that that you would have preferred your office was consulted before this money was sent away to Marshall? I, I think you can read into it that, as a general matter, <laughs> the attorney general likes to weigh in to avoid uh, problems in terms of spending or compliance with the law. It's better as a when you have really difficult issues to uh, work with the AG's office, uh, but. I'm not at all speaking to this specific issue because, quite frankly, uh, if we have to go to court, I want to make sure that when we weigh in and when I speak publicly, it's done with the benefit of all the information. So, uh, And by the way, I will note there are a lot of people, a lot of entities that do come to us and weigh in, and that's great. I've, you know, We have a good working relationship with the executive branch in West Virginia. You know, we work closely with the governor with the Secretary of State, with the Auditor, with the Treasurer, and all of the executive agency clients. So uh, I think as a general matter, people have been very good with us. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, that doesn't always happen, though. And uh, sometimes when it doesn't happen, you run into problems. Matt Harvey. Good morning, General. How are you? I'm doing well, buddy. I hope uh, life is treating you well in Jefferson and Berkeley County. It's treating me very well. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll highlight or echo the, the cost savings that Jefferson County received by the attorney general rightfully reassuming the duties of, of filing the criminal appeals uh, for the county. It, I mean, it's number one, it's, manda- it's mandated by statute, but that saves my office from having to produce transcripts, from assigning a person to you know, the resources and the hours that could be spent in a courtroom instead of behind a desk and a computer. So it, it's a tremendous savings, and, and I really appreciate Attorney uh, uh, General Morrissey for, for being willing to, to take on that. And also, we I'll, I'll note that we work together a lot with uh, investigators from his office. You know, maybe Patrick and I aren't working together as much as our, our staffs are working together, and we have a really good work relationship with their in, in their uh, contractor fraud, which is really rampant in this area, and I assume in other parts. But you have a really terrific investigator there, and he stays in constant contact with our office, and and we're happy to prosecute those cases. Um, but let me get into. You have a new lawsuit, the arm brace lawsuit. Yeah, this is a big one that we filed last week. And for those who haven't heard, I don't know if it received much of the local coverage uh, from the local paper, uh, but I'm glad we're talking about it on the radio today. So last week, uh, we worked with uh, 25 states and a lot of different uh, gun advocacy groups to sue the Biden administration over their so-called pistol brace rule. And for those at home listening, um, think of something that had been legal and had been in place in a long time. There are a number of guns that uh, have accessories. And in this particular case, there's an accessory that a lot of people use, seniors and those who are disabled, sometimes have a strap that they uh, put their arm into, and it helps them hold the uh, gun. It helps them Uh, for purposes of firing accuracy. And the federal government wanted to change the definition of these guns and call them short barrel rifles in an effort to, one, make it illegal for people to have these products uh, without going through a separate process of registration and or, you know, paying an additional tax uh, for uh, the stamp that you need when you get the uh, firearm. Uh, and this is a agency, the ATF, 
that's been effectively saying that all these types of pistol braces were compliant with the law for a long period of time, and now they've changed that. They want to make these uh, accessories and these products uh, subject to uh, criminal prosecution if you don't uh, go through with their new rule. And we got together with all the private parties and 25 states were leading a 25-state coalition. I thought this was a particularly outrageous rule. And here's why. Whenever you have something that's subject to criminal prosecution, even if you believe that the language is ambiguous in terms of whether it should be subject to a crime or not, there's a rule in place that says, look, when you have the rule of lenity, when you have something that is so ambiguous and you're not sure what to do, you should absolutely not be doing criminal prosecutions on the basis of that language. And uh, we feel very strongly that uh, this rulemaking is unlawful. They don't have the authority to act in this space the way they think they do. And separately, uh, that they didn't look, they didn't go to Congress. Congress makes the laws. We had a pretty big case last year that weighed in on that West Virginia VPA that made that same point. And so we're very happy with the case that we're driving. Uh, 25 states were leading, and we're very active. But I think there are a lot of gun owners and people that are pretty happy about it. And once again, these pistol braces, they're not facilitating crime. So we have no idea why the Biden administration is doing this other than they're not for the Second Amendment. And uh, they're just trying to make it harder and harder uh, for people to uh, own and to maintain uh, guns of their choosing. A follow-up to that, it, 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 just, it seems like you're saying that they're protecting accessories um, that, that in the definition of which would infringe upon someone's Second Amendment right. Um, what, why wasn't there an effort to challenge Trump's executive order banning bump stocks? There was. We were actually involved in that. So uh, I know that there, there's still a pending case now in the fifth. Uh, but we had gone through, and we led a multi-state coalition on that, and there's still pending litigation. So uh, we thought that that also had some some challenges. John Gilstrap, I thought the bump stock. I thought courts ruled that um, the bump stock regulations were out of line because it was uh, assigning fines or assigning criminal penalties through legis- through a executive action as opposed to legislative action. Am I wrong on that? Yeah. So. So, yes, so there's been a mixed series of results on bump stock. And uh, I think that there have been some cases that have been won and some that have uh, not. And it's my understanding that that case is still pending as well. So I think we're still kind of waiting for final resolution. If I remember correctly, it's been a few years, (laughs) but there was activity in the Tenth Circuit and in the Fifth Circuit and uh, but I think there's still some uh, litigation left in that space. But look, we've always stood up regardless of uh, who would be in an executive agency. If people uh, don't comply with the rule of law, it's my job is AG to step up. I mean, many people listening may know that uh, we had sued the DEA uh, many years ago and forced them to rewrite the national drug quota system. So I'm kind of equal opportunity when it comes to suing federal agencies and ensuring people comply with the law. Yeah, and it's an indicator of how pernicious this this rule is. I mean, it's all rooted in the fact, let's be honest, that the, the arm brace kind of sort of looks like a, a rifle stock if you look at it, you know, the, the right way. And and I, th- I think that's the excuse that the government is using. I was at the SHOT Show a couple of weeks ago in, in Las Vegas, and ATF had a booth there, and I talked to one of the agents. This, this ruling dropped during the, the SHOT Show. And they point about at the 120-day grace period where people can go and register their firearms. That's where we're going with this. You register right. your firearm, uh, which is kind of a first. And after the 120-day grace period, whoever has not registered becomes a felon. And what this agent told me, and he made me promise never to use his name, but what he told me was that as on the 121st day, when somebody submits their application for the NFA permit, then they are admitting to a felony. Now, I don't know, that seems pretty drastic to me, but that's kind of where the mindset is. And I I, quite honestly, I found that kind of disturbing. 
No, well, look, you're correct about the 120-day period, and there are a lot of people that are very concerned about that. And once again, one of the reasons why we filed the lawsuit and we got a lot of our sister states together, because I think people think this is outrageous. Uh, They don't want the registration. They don't want to have the potential criminal penalty. And look, whenever you talk about deadlines, there's always going to be some people that don't meet the deadlines. And uh, these are people that could become felons very quickly. And that's why we're suing. Uh, We think we have strong arguments. And we're very hopeful that the court is going to give us an injunction on this. Attorney General Patrick Morrissey is with us here on the program. Uh, Patrick, I want to get into a couple of other things, including something that is right up uh, our uh, co-host's uh, alley here, too. And it has to do with the drug cartels and the classification of terrorists that you're seeking. Can you get into a bit more detail on that? Yes. Um, so one of the things that we've been very, very worried about is that we know that there's been a lot of illicit fentanyl that's been coming, the ingredients sourced from China, uh, shipped to the Mexican drug cartels, then the product gets finished and ultimately smuggled across the border into the United States, and then it makes its way up to the heartlands and into uh, West Virginia. We've been very worried uh, that uh, the Chinese government and that these Mexican drug cartels, they know full well what they're doing. They know that there has been an incredible amount of depth, needless depth, because these people are smuggling product uh, in. And so when I look at them and I think of what the drug cartels and what the uh, what they're up to, and I think about the illicit uh, human trafficking, I think about the drug trafficking, you see that these groups are committing actions which we think are clearly violative of the law, and they know that the actions they're involved in are killing and slaughtering people. So, for instance, when it comes to fentanyl, I think many people know that between the ages of 18 and 46, it's actually the number one cause of death in the United States. So one of the things that uh, the AGs have always talked about are changing some of the rules of the game and uh, having different designations reflecting the fact that these are pretty dangerous people and there needs to be a lot more attention on what's going on outside of our country because I could be the AG on civil issues here in West Virginia. Matt could prosecute the heck out of people out of Jefferson County. But look, neither one of us, we're not well positioned to deal with some of the Mexican drug cartels or the Chinese. That's the role of uh, the State Department. It's the role of Uh, the U.S. Attorney General, and the uh, Homeland Security uh, Department. But we thought it would be helpful to uh, label uh, some of these groups as terrorist organizations because they know full well what they're doing. They intend for the slaughter of our citizens, and that needs to be punished. The other thing we've asked for, by the way, is to label fentanyl a weapon of mass destruction because there's so much... uh, need to get the feds more focused and engaged on this and get additional resources to prevent the slaughtering of our citizens. Matt? General, would that bring more resources to bear? It it would. So uh, one of the things that we've been most disturbed about in this fentanyl fight is that the feds have really fallen down on the job. Now, let me say for uh, the record, are U.S. attorneys in West Virginia, you know, I think they're doing good work. And I think that we have some good people in those U.S. attorneys' offices. So this is no shot at the local West Virginia U.S. attorneys' office. But they are not, not getting the support they need from Merrick Garland and the U.S. Attorney General. And that's a big issue. So if you label something a weapon of mass destruction, you're going to get a lot more resources to flow And I think it's going to be easier uh, to uh, fight this battle because this is coming in at all levels uh, with the smuggling of what comes into the state. So it's penetrating West Virginia, where we have more fentanyl deaths than any other state per capita. And it will help a lot with resources. And I think it's part of what needs to be done to address this terrible fentanyl plague. 
John, you've spent some time at the border. I have spent time at the border, and I've, I've done a lot of research into the the this the scourge of, on on America. It seems to me it'd just be a lot easier if we relabel or we pass legislation that cause uh, trafficking in fentanyl to be attempted murder, because that's really what it is. Look, I mean, I've been very open to changes in the criminal code, uh, and I know. In West Virginia, uh, there have been some changes over time. But look, most of the fentanyl prosecutions people expect are going to come out of the feds. And there have been precious few, and in part because of the resources and the lack of priority from the U.S. Attorney uh, General's Office and the Department of Justice. So, look, uh, there are a lot of things we can do. I've called for some changes in the laws. I've called for a lot more focus in terms of not only weapon of mass destruction, but just enforcing the darn law at the border. You know, we've gone after the Homeland Security Department to get them to have some basic policies at the border. You know, one of our lawsuits actually was saying, look, uh, Homeland Security, when you're enforcing the laws, you have to have some anti-drug trafficking component. And the actual rulemaking that they had for a long time didn't even have that. And so, we thought that that was completely uh, barred under the law. It was arbitrary and capricious. You can't just have a border policy without really thinking through the implications on drugs. And I've been down at the border, probably not as much as you have, but uh, it is an unmitigated disaster when you can have more drugs flowing into your country to kill every man, woman, and child. And uh, we are not doing enough. It's a huge problem, and it's affecting West Virginia. I think the death toll last year nationwide was 107,000 people, which is twice the the losses in Vietnam over 10 years. Uh, something a, has a to year. be... A year. In a year. Yeah. Yeah. yeah in, in one year. In, in 50, wanna... 50 times 9-11's effect right. on the world. Right. Every year. And it seems to... You know, we can relabel things. We can call it terrorism. We can do whatever else. But until people in the authority that actually affect the laws decide to to enforce the laws... Yeah, it's just it's it's disgusting. It's infuriating. I got nothing. Look, this is a colossal uh, mismanagement of uh, one of the single most important challenges facing our nation. I mean, think about it. From the age of eighteen to forty-six, your most likely cause of death is fentanyl. And what's been the principal reason for this? Because the federal government is not doing its job. Now, I recognize that there's always going to be some smuggling. But we could significantly cut down on what's happening. But these guys literally want a porous border for some crass political reasons. And meanwhile, people are dying. You know, gentlemen, I had a number of the families who had loved ones who they lost to fentanyl. I had them down in my office a couple of months ago. And it's just it's horrifying to hear the stories of people who've lost sons and daughters where they had no idea that, uh, some of the products that were being consumed were laced with fentanyl. I've been going out to some of the schools, and Matt, I'd be interested in your perspective on this, but I go out to some of the schools where we talk about vaping and the dangers of vaping, and you might have people that think that they're taking some, uh, maybe it's cannabis or maybe it's some other product, and fentanyl could get laced in the vaping, and all you have to do is just snort a little bit of that, and boom, you're dead. One pill kills and these guys on the federal government in D.C. just don't care. And it's not getting the attention it needs here in West Virginia. It's not getting it nationally. Yeah, Fox and Newsmax and OAN and some of the publications cover it, but not nearly enough. Patrick, before you go, I want to ask you about that Terrence Group poll. I know you haven't announced if you're going to be running for another office for next uh, term or not, whether that's the uh, governor's office or Senate office. But would the poll have any influence on your decision making? No, I mean, I, look, I, first of all, I don't think that poll is probably even accurate. Um, so I, I'm not going to let a poll that gets commissioned uh, for the intent of luring someone in uh, guide my decision making. I mean, here's, here's what I, I think will happen. People are going to know who has a record of accomplishment. And if you look at all the potential candidates running for any of the offices, there's going to be one record that stands out. And I think that's going to be our record. If you go through the list and say, who is the one you could most rely on from a Second Amendment perspective, who's had huge and concrete 
victories defending our gun rights, who is absolutely uh, pro-life, who has stepped up to defend the Hope Scholarship Law, the school choice provisions, who won the single most uh, critical uh, U.S. Supreme Court case, which was the biggest victory against the swamp probably in decades. That's West Virginia VPA. Who's protected our uh, jobs here in the state? Who stood up to ensure that uh, people know the difference between uh, biological males and women, and that biological males don't play in women's sports. When you look at the long list, and we could go on and on, who has the number one rated per capita opioid settlements in the nation? I mean, it, it's not going to be a close call. So I think that as people continually get reminded about the record of accomplishment, uh, then I feel good that whatever office uh, I pursue will be successful. So you know, I have a lot of respect for all the people that are running or thinking about running. So this is not the time and place to engage in contrast. But I feel good that that record is going to resonate with a lot of people across West Virginia. Do you have a timeline for when you might announce? You know, I, I think I said a couple of weeks ago that I was looking at a 30 to 60 day time period. I, I still think that's about uh, the case. Uh, there's more work that I want to get done. As you guys know, uh, we had a big lawsuit we filed last week. Uh, we have another one that we're filing uh, today. And so uh, stay tuned. We have a press conference at 1.30. It's another major national lawsuit. Matters a lot to West Virginia. And, in fact, it's something that uh, I've done town halls and I've talked to people in Jefferson and Berkeley County about. Uh, so it, this is going to be a, a wonderful opportunity. So I get to keep doing my day job where a lot of people are uh, really working. The, they're uh, moving to the next level in terms of politics. But I think people know we just had an election. And so I thought it'd be nice to just keep doing your day job for a while. Uh, that's, that's what the voters elect you for. And that's what I'm certainly doing. Attorney General Patrick Morrissey, thank you very much for your time today. Hey, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Have, Have a good, good day. day. Thank you, General.